Hi everyone, so in this video I'm just going to be looking at some of the more kind of literary features of these two short stories rather than kind of doing the big kind of sociological exposition. So again, this was kind of a week where I noticed how similar these two stories were kind of after putting them together. So just at the top right of this image, uh, yeah, these are just kind of things that reoccurred, I guess, in both stories. There's both kind of cigarettes uh, are kind of uh, primary symbols of the story uh, for some reason vodka soda or, or vodka tonic comes up in both stories and even going back to cat person vodka i think vodka soda came up in that story as well so it's one of those weird details that keep coming up um and then both stories also kind of finish off at the same time so at this kind of weird hour between about 4 a.m and 5 a.m uh is where the characters of both stories kind of end up at the end so those are just kind of some weird connections between between the two stories but I want to look at uh, kind of some more particular uh, to the modern intimate, some uh, imagery that are, that's going on that kind of, I think, runs through the whole story and I think is important. So darkness. Um, and these kind of quotes that I've just pulled out, they all kind of reference darkness in different ways. Um, so, um, yeah, maybe I'll just read them. I hate it when people come into a room I'm working in and turn the light on over my head smugly, like I'm too stupid to not have figured it out myself. I choose the darkness. I hang on to it for as long as possible. Uh, talking about her nails, right now they're maximum midnight. Um, and then when she's reading the, the short, the, I guess, yeah, the short story to Eric, uh, her eyes are described as dark, so... Um, she also has like the black fingernails. There's a lot of kind of darkness kind of associated with her. Um, and then near the end of the story, uh, she says it's dark. There's a laurel bush around the whole house. It's over 10 feet high and several feet thick, impenetrable. So all these references to darkness also kind of uh, play into the whole structure of the story. So the structure or the architecture of the story involves Carrie constantly being at night. And so she, at the very start of the story, uh, she is kind of operating in kind of the very early, early morning um, when it's still kind of dark out. And uh, at the end of the story, she is also, again, uh, her, she's in the night again, but at the end of the day uh, when she can't sleep. Uh, and by contrast, Eric uh, is uh, constantly kind of in the day. Um, so... The story is kind of set up where she kind of owns the uh, the night and Eric kind of owns the day. Um, so there's a, there's a lot kind of going on there. there. I don't think there's kind of a definite answer why Carrie is kind of aligned with darkness and Eric is kind of aligned with light or day. Uh, I mean, when you look at that first quote, uh, you can have kind of two different readings of her character. So you can kind of read this first quote as a kind of a character flaw that she likes to kind of be oblivious to what's kind of going on around her. Uh, she kind of talks about that when she talks about kind of ignoring all these signs that Eric had given her, that he wasn't that serious about her. Uh, kind of ignorance is bliss, kind of character flaw. Or, I mean, you can also kind of read it uh, a little bit more favorably, I think, that um, she kind of likes to operate in that kind of more, um, or her, her feelings are kind of more, ambiguous or or that's where she kind of places romance in in the nighttime um, as some kind of uh, counterpart to the kind of the the work day that Eric participates in um, so but most importantly there's kind of a strong separation between uh, what's going on at night which are all these kind of personal reflections of Carrie's uh, and what's going on the day with Eric Although there, he does have some kind of personal reflections, he's very kind of concentrated on his kind of work life. Um, so I think the most important thing, wh whatever you think about that darkness, is that these kind of, uh, the darkness and the light are kind of set up in opposition in the story. And I think figuring out why they're, why they're like that is, uh, is a key to the story. Um, so that's about it for this. I mean, uh, the last kind of quote there, so it's dark, there's a laurel bush around the whole house. It's over 10 feet high and several feet thick and penetrable. Um, again, uh, this kind of seems like a, a defense that, that Carrie has, that uh, even though she seems very vulnerable in the story, uh, I read this kind of talking about the laurel bush 
that she's not as vulnerable as perhaps uh, she's made out to be. She still has her own defenses against these kind of characters like Eric, and she still has a little bit of mystery to her that even though Eric's going to dump her, uh, she still will be fine, I guess. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so then just moving on to, to Clams, um, I think it's a little bit obvious from the title of the story. Uh, there's a lot of kind of underwater or ocean image imagery. Um, and yeah, I, I won't read out these quotes, but um, again, these kind of quotes give like the impression that uh, this character is underwater a little bit, that uh, she has a kind of hard time uh, surfacing uh, or coming up to that light uh, in, a, in the same way as Carrie a little bit. Uh, she's kind of, uh, yeah, just floating underwater um, and having a tr hard time kind of seeing uh, what's exactly happening and why it's happening. Okay, and then this kind of uh, goes into, uh, so I kind of talked about the architecture of the modern intimate. Uh, I'm just gonna bring up some quotes that kind of suggest detachment or distance in clams. And I think these quotes also kind of play into the, into the architecture of the story as well. So I'll just bring up these quotes. So yeah. Um, She's very kind of detached uh, from her emotions. She feels kind of detached from other people in these quotes. Uh, she feels kind of lack of control. Uh, this is kind of, this last quote that I just brought up is kind of one of my favorite moments of the story. So they're describing the movie Goodfellas. Uh, it's kind of very Mar Marie Calloway-ish language where the narrator just completely detaches herself from the story or disappears in a way and just kind of recounts details. And here the reader has to kind of uh, do a lot of work to uh, to kind of generate the feeling that should probably accompany these actions. So Joe Pesci is sitting in the back seat of a car and stabs the head of a man sitting in the front seat. Nate eats tuna from a can. The movie is over, they go to bed. So obviously there's a lot of kind of feelings that are probably taking place, you would hope, uh, during a scene like this. Uh, it obviously just sounds very kind of depressing. I mean, Goodfellas is incredibly violent. Like, you can't just watch Goodfellas and not feel some kind of uh, revulsion toward the violence because it's so realistically depicted. Uh, but here, there's obviously kind of a strong kind of detachment or the narrator kind of goes underwater, perhaps, that uh, uh, she's not really doing the work for the reader telling the reader how she feels. It's just kind of these details. And perhaps that makes the emotion uh, that the reader is called to kind of generate more, more powerful a little bit. And then even the ending of the story. So uh, we talked, we've talked a little bit about epiphany so far in this course. Uh, and even epiphany kind of comes up in the modern intimate that the Carrie says that she doesn't really want to have an epiphany. Uh, with that light, she says, with the light being turned on, so to speak, uh, she likes to stay in the dark. Um, so she's kind of resistant uh, to epiphany. Um, and here in this story, kind of the idea of epiphany is this sudden kind of realization uh, or message from God or whatever. Uh, again, the epiphany is kind of very detached. So uh, she throws the cigarette off the balcony, it lands in an orange burst on the grass. Insects and bacteria around the cigarette feel the impact of an atomic bomb. So the whole story is about her inability to feel. Uh, sometimes, like in one of the earlier quotes I have here, she's, she talks about how she's detached from her emotions. Um, and here, like the, the actual impact of everything that's happened to her uh, happens on the insects and bacteria. She kind of throws it away and even kind of any kind of insight or realization uh, is kind of still kind of detached uh, from her from her or distant from her. And I think all these kind of uh, these kind of quotes about detachment or distance, uh, they also play into the architecture of the story. So uh, the whole architecture of the story is that there's this distance between these two characters, between Philadelphia and Portland, which is the whole kind of country. It's East Coast, West Coast. So there's a major kind of distance between these two characters. 
that uh, is kind of bridged. So the Nate character comes, uh, travels across the whole country to see Anne. And there's that kind of uh, bridging of distance. But as soon as Nate arrives, uh, there's still kind of a very profound distance between these two characters. So the whole architecture of the story is about uh, a distant relationship but a distant relationship in kind of a different way than we think of a distant relationship. So we think of a distant relationship as being kind of geographic, uh, two people living in different cities, but I would argue, and what the story depicts, sorry, there's a skunk that just walked by. <laughs> uh, what the story kind of depicts is that a distant relationship, uh, the distance feels more profound when they're actually close to each other. So it's kind of, I think the story challenges a little bit what we think about distant relationships. So yeah, that's all. I want to keep this video short. So that's all I have. Um, so that's it for the lecture videos for this week. And I'll see you guys on the Discord and the Zoom. Hope you're doing well. Bye for now.